Good to sit with me for a little while. Um, today, I'm going to talk about focus um, with regard to growing your business, your agency. I use the term agency, which, um, which is a funny term. I mean, an agency to me can mean an agency of one or an agency of 10,000 and anything in between. So um, I'm curious just to start out here uh, to get a feel for what the room does. Um, how many people in here are self-employed? Most, okay. And whether self-employed or not, how many people provide some sort of WordPress-related services to other businesses or people? Most, again, I figured. Um, but just never know. Um, so there was a, an, an HBO documentary about Warren Buffett. For anybody who doesn't know who he is, I think he's now the third or fourth richest man in the world. Been on that list forever. Greatest investor of all time. Um, I think I think the documentary was called Becoming Warren Buffett, and. Um, and the, the journalist asked uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett to both write down what the one thing was that they would attribute most to their success. And um, it surprised me they wrote, they both wrote down the, the same exact thing. And, um, and the word was focus. And watching that, it, it prompted me to, to look at my career and my business and you know the things that that have made um, that have made my business fairly successful, um, and, uh, and there's been a lot of things that have attributed to that. Uh, but you know, again, watching this documentary and, and and particularly that part, I realized that it's been the same for me, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about here today. And, and I think I'm going to start with uh, with just a little bit of a background where I um, where I come from, where I've, where I've gone, that, that, is, that has gotten me to, to talk about this stuff. Um, I, don't, I don't think this talk is going to teach about a lot of specifics and tactical stuff about sales and marketing, um, or a lot about business per se. Um, I see this talk more as um, maybe reinforcing a lot of things that might seem like common sense that you might realize, yes, I should do a better job of that, and I should be thinking about that more, and maybe differently. Um, and that's what I hope you'll get out of this talk, and maybe leave here with a little bit more focus on some of the things that you think could improve your own business. So, I'm very old in this business. I started right when this stuff all came out, 20 years ago. Um, my co-founder at Imagine and I were building our first websites right around 95. And so we were just a couple of guys that didn't know what we were doing. Uh, college dropouts, no money in our pockets. We were not web designers, we were not web developers. We were, I would call us kind of jack of all trades, sales and marketing guys that were doing a variety of, of things for clients. I was kind of a writer. He was a little more technical than I was. Um, and one of his clients asked him to build a website. And Nobody knew how to build websites at that time, so his answer was no, but I will. Um, and he went out and built a website, and that's when it all started, and he encouraged me to take a look at this stuff, and, um, and I picked it up, and so we, uh, this was all around, like I said, 95, 96, and back then it was in, um, he, he had learned Cold Fusion. Uh, there was no WordPress back then, by the way. Um, and um, started building some sites on Cold Fusion. Over the years, we, Involved into a few other things. We were on ASP for a while. We were on ASP.NET. Um, when we eventually went to open source, we played around with the other open source tools you know. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention them at WordCamps. Um, <laughs> and and so um, we we spent the first I would say ten of these past twenty years really flailing, um, doing okay for ourselves. Like we were making a living. We we're paying our bills. But we definitely had zero focus on anything. It was pretty much doing anything that anybody would pay us to do. We were building websites for any business that would talk to us, um, that would give us a check to build their websites, or do their SEO, or do anything uh, related to the web, really. And, 
And like I said, it was fine. We uh, we managed to to at least support ourselves, but I wouldn't say we had much of a business that could be defined. Um, and um, and a few things happened around, let's just say, you know, maybe 10, 11 years ago. Um, and some of that was like, you know, we happen to be based in the Boston area, and there's a lot of tech, obviously, with all of these great schools in the Boston area. Um, and so. You know, some of the things that I'll talk about here today, go into a little bit more detail, was like even focus on certain markets, certain types of companies, certain industries, sorry, certain industries that became focuses for us. And, and being in the Boston area, tech was one of those, and biotech. And so um, some of the things that we have focused on over the years have not been intentional at all. They kind of happened by mistake. Um, but turned out to be very important things and turned out to teach us the importance of focusing on certain things and not just industries and markets. I'm going to talk about all the things that I believe from my experience have been most important to our success in, in terms of in terms of focus. Um, and, and the first one is, that I'm going to talk about here is your strengths. So we like I said when, when my partner and I started we didn't have a lot of these. We we even to this day Neither of us are strong web designers or developers. Uh, we played that role for a while. It was just the two of us. Um, I would design stuff. Brett, my co-founder, would develop stuff. Neither of us are, are too tremendous at those things. Um, but we're good marketing people, so we've always come at things from, from that angle. We've always talked to our clients more about stuff that we know how to talk about best, like marketing, like sales, like business. And have had to learn, obviously, a lot about the things that we're selling to our clients, which is website-related types of, of services. Um, but as opposed to um, probably many of you who are great designers, great developers, and could speak that language a lot better than we've ever been able to, um, we recognize what our strengths were after a while, whereas at the very beginning we were trying to talk about everything, we wanted to believe that we could be great at everything, um, and at a certain point we stepped back and said, you know what, we've got to decide what we're really good at, where we're going to excel for our clients, and stop trying to sound like we're great at everything. Um, and even today, as we've grown a lot. So Imagine is about 50 people. We're based down in southern Massachusetts. Um, we have an office in, in Fall River where most of our people work out of. I work down in South Florida. We have a small office down there. We've got a handful of remote employees. Um, but even today, you know, we're, we're not good at everything. Um, and I think that recognizing that over the years and recognizing the things that we are really good at and focusing on those things and focusing on getting more of that type of work, which, which I'll get into specifically what that is, but I don't think that's all that relevant. Um, what we're good at, what we've become good at, is not at all necessarily what any of you are going to be good at. Um, we all have our unique strengths, we all have our core competencies. The point I'm making is take the time to recognize what those are and focus on them and be great at them. And, and realize that you, you don't have to be great at everything and you don't have to pretend to be great at everything. There is a market out there for whichever your strengths happen to be, usually. Now, somebody might have some really obscure strength that nobody's willing to spend money on. That's a great hobby. Um, so, you know, to a certain extent, you do have to evaluate what, which of your strengths are actually lucrative opportunities and, and focus on those. And I recommend most people, um, to use a, a college term, uh, do a little bit of a SWOT analysis on themselves. And SWOT, if anybody doesn't know what that stands for, SWOT is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So, like I said, it's something that is kind of a corporate term. People sit around in board meetings and do these things on a much formal basis, even if it's just you. Um, write those things down, evaluate what those are for you, recognize your strengths, your weaknesses, so that you can leverage those. And once in a while, some of those weaknesses might be things that you decide to get better at, but again, what I strongly encourage people to do is recognize what your strengths are, and as long as those are opportunities in the, in the marketplace, focus on them and speak to people about those things that you're really good at. And again, be okay with the fact that you're not going to be great at everything, and be everything to everyone. So 
once we recognize the type of work that we were really good at, and this pertains to this next slide here, um, that actually helped us determine who we were going to be best working for. So I'll, I'll be pretty specific here. Um, again, we're, we're not the greatest web developers, in, and, and I, I actually believe the people that work for us today now are really great at that. But generally speaking, it's not where we came from. So we've never really focused on building the most complex technical solutions. Um, Imagine does not, is not the company to come to if, uh, if a big e-commerce site needed to be built that was going to have a uh, hundred thousand SKUs on it, or a million SKUs. That's that's not who we are. As I said earlier on, we're marketing people. So a lot of the websites, I'd say most of the 1,500 plus websites we've built over our 20 years have been pretty simple sites. Um, really good sites, and sites that some big companies have been willing to pay us to do for them. But relatively speaking, for our industry, um, probably a lot simpler sites than many of you have built. Um, typically brochure type of website, maybe integrated with some CRM systems and ERP systems, marketing automation, but typically the, the websites we've built over the years were, were there to inform a company's audience about what they do, who they are, generate leads for them, provide some educational material. Again, what we in the industry call brochure sites. That's mostly what we focused on because that's what we're good at. We're marketers. Um, we're not the most technical company. Um, and so with that, with recognizing the type of work that we're really good at and the type of work that we knew we could make money at, that kind of helped us also determine the types of companies that would most align with what we're good at. So as, as you evaluate your skills and your strengths and the type of work that you're best at and want to pursue, then after you do that and you look at the type of companies that might be the best fit for that, you try to bring those together. So as an example, this background image for us happens to be uh, a, like a biotechnology or healthcare related company. So that's, that's been our primary industry over the year, uh, over the years. And again, kind of irrelevant here because our markets might not at all pertain to what your best markets would be. And we've worked in several of them. We've, We've done a lot of work in B2B, manufacturing, professional services, um, high-tech companies, again, for years being based in this region. Uh, that was our bread and butter. We literally, I think, built like seven, 800 websites for small tech startups and biotech startups. Again, very simple websites for these types of companies, but we were really good at them. We developed a process and a system for getting them done. We could do them very profitably. We built a portfolio full of them, which enabled us to sell more of them and for more and more companies like our other clients to want to work with us. Um, so picking our markets, and, and it didn't happen all at once. We didn't sit there one day and decide, these are the industries we're going to work on, and that just stuck forever. That's evolved over the years. We've added industries little by little over the years. It happens to be, I mean, just to be really transparent and specific today, um, a lot of the industries we've worked with over the years have gone by the wayside for us. We've gotten really, really focused. And in the past two to three years, um, healthcare, healthcare is almost our only market that we're laser focused on at the moment. So, um, so we've worked in construction, manufacturing, professional services, like I said, but we've done so much in healthcare. For healthcare for us, it means everything from biotech to pharmaceutical medical devices, health IT companies, and even hospitals and insurance, anything and everything related to healthcare. Um, I, I'm biased, I personally think it's the best market to be in. Um, the most recession proof, there's endless opportunity there, but again, I don't wanna get too much on that soapbox because this is really about picking some certain things that are best for you, that you might happen to have the best skill set in or the most experience in, and focusing more and more on that thing so that you can get more of it and be more of the expert in that particular thing. Ours just happens to be the health sector and all of the sectors related to that. But I will say, if this sticks even as the most salient point that I make in this entire talk, that the decision to focus on a few markets and really go after them and be able to speak as experts in those industries and just pursue more and more of those types of companies 
has been the single most thing that we have, single most important thing that we have focused on that has resulted in success in our 20 year history. Um, so aside from all the other things I'm going to talk about focusing on, focusing on certain companies in certain industries has been the most successful decision for us and continues to be today. Um, so if I leave you with nothing else, I would ask you to think about that if you're currently in the business of just working horizontally and doing anything for anyone in whatever industry. Um, and I'm glad to talk more about this with anybody after as well. Um, so the next thing that, that we had to focus on, and I kind of went through a little bit of the evolution here at the beginning, is technology. Um, and we're obviously at a WordPress conference, and so most of us, or not all of us here, work on WordPress, but some of you might offer other platforms, other technologies, and I'm not going to say that I think that's a mistake, because there might be somebody in here in this room who is truly an expert at multiple platforms. For us, even as a 50-person agency, we think it's literally impossible for us to be great at multiple platforms. Um, and we've tried in the past. And we don't want to be good at a few platforms. We want to be great at something. And it wasn't an easy decision to decide which of those things we were going to be great at. Um, and to give a specific example, as much as we all love WordPress and as much as our clients love WordPress and the world of marketers loves WordPress, we sell to big companies and they're not all on board with WordPress. And that's a challenge that we have every day and a fight that we're fighting and um, even joining together with other firms in the enterprise WordPress space to promote the message that WordPress can be used for bigger companies and it's not just a blogging tool as many of you still believe it is. Um, so choosing which technology and which platform to be great at can be a little bit difficult. Um, but once again, um, I would say that it's up there in the top two or three most important decisions we've ever made um, in terms of choosing one thing to be great at. And it's not even just about being great at it. It's being perceived as being great at it. So, so by imagine promoting ourselves as a leading enterprise WordPress agency, um, we look a heck of a lot better at that than if we said we're an agency who does Drupal, Sitecore, Joomla, WordPress, and we do all of these things tremendously. That's not a strong message. Um, and so by being so focused on one particular platform, and I think some people will have some trepidation about this, and we certainly did, you will lose business by being so focused because you rule out all those other platforms and all of those potential clients that don't like WordPress or don't believe in it or know nothing about it. Um, and it's, I'm not gonna say that that's been fine for us. We literally lose millions of dollars a year in potential business if we were great at all of those other things I just listed. But we can, and it's just a reality. We could take them on, we could, we could try to do those projects, we'd probably win a lot of them, and it would mean millions of dollars in contracts, and we would fail. And we would not do a great job on those projects, and then everything else that comes along with it. We would, you know, as you all know, when you build a website, it's not over with the project. You've got to support those clients long after the fact. Um, there's a lot that comes with claiming to master a particular technology or platform. And so, like I said, it's a hard decision sometimes because you're alienating a lot of the market. Um, but again, a very important one. Be great at something and, and promote yourself as such and go after that business. There's plenty of it out there. And as we know, the great thing about the one that we've all chosen to be great at here is it kills the market, right? So at least we've all chosen the one that owns 28% of the internet. Um, so, you know, think about it if you're offering some of these other things. Again, if you're excellent at all of them, that's great for you. But we don't believe that's, uh, that's all that realistic. Focus on the clients that actually make money for you and don't waste your time. Um, and uh, it's another thing that sometimes is not that easy. And, and, and if anybody in the room has multiple clients, assuming most of you do, 
Um, you all know that there are clients who are great. They don't complain. They make decisions quickly. They pay you fast. They pay enough. Sometimes maybe they don't pay enough, but they still pay you fast. And they don't complain a lot. You know, there's a lot of different definitions of what the right customers are. But you all know who the wrong customers are, right? And, and they're the ones that, that drain you. They're the ones that every single time you see an email from them in your inbox or, or see your phone ringing and the caller ID says it's them, that you stress about, that you dread, that you never want to talk to, uh, you lose sleep over these folks, um, get rid of them. It's, it's just, you know, you've got to focus on who's making you money and who's not giving you heartburn 24 seven and draining all of your time and hire some clients. It's not always easy to do. Um, for us, you know, we've been in business so long that a lot of our clients are like family to us. Uh, you know, we, we've got certain clients that, that are still back from 1996 who paid us $700 for a website, even though, you know, today we're doing six-figure projects. Um, we keep some of them around just because they're family. We try to help them out as much as we can. But, um, but the ones who are the real, you know, pain in the butt, dragging you down, just take some time, look through those, do an assessment of if that's really good for your business to keep them around. And at a certain point, you've got to put loyalty and friendship aside with some of those clients you might love but are harming your business and, um, and filter some of them out. It's been, it's been, again, it's been a very strategic thing that we've done every so often. Sometimes it's a very easy decision. Someone's a jerk, someone speaks to our employees improperly, disrespectfully. Um, if we flat out know that, that even up front, even before we have the contract, uh, we just last week, we had, um, it was a CEO. We're not always dealing with a CEO, but with, on the smaller side of, of some of our clients, we're dealing directly with the CEO. And even prior to the sale, this, this woman was making our team our team's lives miserable. We didn't even have the contract yet. And everybody was so stressed out about talking to her. And so even though she was, she chose us to do what she needed to do, it was actually an SEO engagement um, that was gonna be a, a pretty hefty monthly fee um, and very tempting, but we, we had a conversation at the last minute after she told us, I wanna go with you guys. And um, very uncomfortably, we had to tell her, sorry, we're not gonna take your business. Um, and um, we weren't rude about it, but we had to let her know how much she was stressing us out and wanted to be honest and transparent about it. Anyway, whether it's before you take the deal or whether it's clients that you've had for years, focus on the good ones. Get rid of the bad ones. You don't need it. There's plenty out there who are not going to waste your time. Focus on the right project. So, you know, the last slide was about people and, uh, and the types of clients that you want. But the types of projects are important too. And we certainly have taken on a lot of projects over the years that we shouldn't have done. Those tend to happen when you need the money. Unfortunately, we all need the money at all times, right? So it's, um, it's hard to ever not be tempted when there's a project in front of you and a potential contract that's gonna pay some bills. Um, but once again, in retrospect, as we look back, as badly as we needed the money in many of those cases, We've taken on some projects that we knew were not right for us, we knew they were a bad fit, and sure enough, we wish later we never did it. And, and you know, it's easy to say later on that we shouldn't have done that, but trust me, um, go with your gut. And, and when it doesn't feel like the right fit for you and it's out of your wheelhouse, and you're really worried about failing and falling on your face with that project, don't take it. Go with your gut. Now, that said, there's, this is a business where we're always learning, so I'm not, I'm not at all suggesting that you don't take on stuff that's gonna push your boundaries a bit and might be slightly outside of your current skill set or above your skill level. That's what we all have to do all the time. I mean, we're still today, we take on stuff that might be slightly out of our wheelhouse that we have to learn on the fly. But that's not what I'm talking about when I say that something is blatantly a non-fit and only represents revenue. It's just not worth it. Um, so really try to define what types, and, and you know, maybe again, maybe you haven't taken the time to define this, 
But sit down and look at your project portfolio, the stuff that you've done very well, the stuff that you know how to do and you've developed a process for it to be streamlined and where you've made clients happy, and then you know what to look for and what to focus on and, and the types of things that you can replicate over and over again for other clients. And learn to say no. The power of no is one of the other most important things that we've learned over the years um, and it took a long time to get there. We, we didn't say no to anybody for the first several years in business. If you were paying, we were doing it. Um, but the power of no can be amazing because it's a risky game to play and I, I wouldn't say that we play this game, but usually when you say no and you do it tactfully, it's going to actually make the prospect or the client want to work with you even more. Um, as long as you do it professionally and you give them a good reason. And that doesn't mean that you then want to take on the wrong project, but sometimes that project could even be modified to fit your skill set. And we've had that happen. We've had a client that because we turned it down, their question back to us was, well, how can we work with you? We really like you. We really like what you guys have done. Um, we don't want to just end this relationship. What would you be comfortable for, you know, doing with us? And then we laid that out for them and they ended up signing a contract for the things that we actually thought we were good at for them. So again, the power of no can be amazing. Um, just, uh, just know what's, what's in your wheelhouse, what's not, and, um, and be comfortable with turning that stuff down. I'll also ask you to focus on your unique differentiators. And um, this, this is another challenging one. Um, we all build websites, or we build web applications, or we do SEO, um, and so few people that I meet can tell me what their unique differentiator is in this business. Um, but when you think about it, if you don't have one, then why should anybody choose to work with you? Just because you're good at this? They're, they're likely to talk to 10 other people who are good at this, or great at this. So just being good is not enough of a differentiator to get you chosen to do the work um, in a very crowded market. And this is a very crowded market. I mean, there are just you know a million new web designers and web developers popping up every week in this country. It's the hottest thing that you could be in and do, especially in the WordPress sector. And so, and even just if you look at threats, if you work on the small business side of things in WordPress, and you look at things like Squarespace and Wix, um, and usually you know some heads will shake when I mention those because we all know that those are not what we do. We're real web designers and web developers, and those are templated tools. Those are threats on the small business side. The sites that you can build with those tools are beautiful, and they're cheap, and they're quick and people will use them to build a beautiful, quick, cheap website. So you need something that is a differentiating value that will make a client say, I don't just want quick, cheap, and pretty. I want to work with that person because he or she is an expert and I'm going to get a lot of value out of them that I'm not going to get from one of those online tools. So, so take the time, determine what your differentiating value is, um, we've had several over the years. Ultimately for us, I would say, and they're not always exciting. Our biggest one has become our extensive experience and, and portfolio in the particular markets that we focus on. So that might not sound all that creative or unique, but it has been our biggest strength, our unique differentiator. When we go into a, a medical device company, the fact that we have done like 700 of those or 500 of those, and we know that business, and you're not going to have to educate us as much as you might have to with somebody else, and we can speak their language going right in. It's a, it's a very big differentiator. And sometimes you might have to get really creative with this and come up with a differentiator that might not even be all that different. Um, so an example of that would be like, I think this was back in the 80s, one of the big advertising agencies was doing ad work for one of the major soda brands and they ran a campaign that said we sterilize our bottles and um, and that was like a differentiator that they determined through focus groups that people thought wow that's awesome right well do you think the FDA doesn't require that every company uses sterile bottles you know it's like your your differentiating value and, how, and what you message that as 
Doesn't necessarily have to be different. A lot of times this is just marketing. All right, thank you. Um, so come up with something. Come up with a couple things that make you stronger, make you a little bit different from the millions and millions of other WordPress developers and designers that are out there. And, 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 and use that message. Use it really well and stand by it. You know, develop some sort of unique message that you're repeating to everybody you talk to. It's in your email signature. It's on your website. Maybe you do some email blasts to some prospects. You're using it. It becomes the thing that all of your prospects say, I know that's the thing they stand for. And maybe that thing isn't going to be what everyone cares about, but some of them will, and they'll respect it a lot. Focus on your goals. And in order to focus on your goals, you've got to develop some of them. And again, I bring this one up because I meet so many people. I speak at a lot of word camps and I do meetups and I meet a lot of people in this business and very rarely do I meet people who have written down specific goals. And goals can be anything. Uh, goals can be numbers you want to reach. Goals can be maybe you want to grow to this number of employees. Goals can be a certain plugin that you want to master. Um, it's, it, it doesn't matter what those goals are, but create some of them and keep track of yourself and make sure that you're achieving them along the way. Um, for us, you know, we have, we have goals that we wanted to get into certain markets um, and do better in those markets. We have goals and certain things that we wanted to improve in our marketing. We had certain goals each year, like we built a new website for ourselves this year. So the goals are things from the very macro down to the very micro. Um, point I'm making here is develop some of those, write them down. It's the most important thing that I've ever read um, in any business or self-help book or any seminar I've ever attended, including Anthony Robbins. Write down your goals and keep track of them and check in on them every couple months or hang them above your desk um, and, and just check yourself on those once in a while. Work with the right people. I talked about this from a client perspective, but it means in general. Um, I, happen to, I happen to work with, there's a few family members in my company, including my sister and my wife, who are sitting here right in the front row. They both work with Imagine, but aside from them, I mean, 50 people, we're not, by no means are we some huge company, but that's a lot of people to manage relationships with and feel pretty tight with. And yesterday we had our annual summer barbecue. Um, I really feel close to all of these people and I think I can pretty proudly say that they would feel the same about me. Um, and it's, and it's, be, it's not because I'm any wonderful human being, it's because we have cared a lot about working with the right people and hiring the right people. And that means in terms of maybe business partners, maybe it's not employees, but maybe it's people you choose to work with. If you're a developer, maybe you work with a designer. Um, maybe some of you work with a writer. Uh, we all work with a variety of people in this business. And again, just like I said with clients, if, if, if you work with somebody who you know it just is bad for your business, it's stressful, maybe they're greedy, there could be a lot of reasons to not work with certain people. Filter those people out of your lives. And focus on the good people. For me, um, I've always focused more on the right personalities over skill set, and I, I'm not going to say that that's the right way to go. I think if you would ask my my partner Brett, um, he would he would probably say that he's pretty equal on those, and maybe even value skill set a little more. And that does all mean he's willing to hire a jerk, but he always wants to hire the best, most skilled, talented people. And admittedly, I've always been a lot more about the personality and just feeling good about having the right type of person for our culture and the types of people that we are. Um, but it served us well. We sit back once in a while and we say, my God, what a great team of people that we have. It's amazing that we're this lucky. And then we have to realize, you know, we've done this. This is because we don't hire that person that rubbed us the wrong way in the interview. Or we don't end up working with that strategic partner that made us feel a little bit wary of them. So, um, you know, take an evaluation of the people in your work life and maybe filter a few of those out and focus on the good ones. Focus on your business. Um, work on your business a little bit and not just work in your business. And again, something that 
is hard to do for a lot of people. We, we all have the tasks that need to get done every day, and we all have clients breathing down our necks and deadlines and, and certain things that we have to learn and master and sit for hours and hours in front of the computer getting better at, and as a result, we, we easily end up technicians as opposed to business people and executives. And even if you're a business of one, you should be the executive of that business and not just be a technician whose, heads, whose head is down all day and coding or designing and just working on WordPress stuff. You need to think of your business. You need to be strategic. You need to focus on all the things I'm talking about here today, but I surely don't know at all. There's a lot of other things that I know nothing about that you should focus on. The point I'm making is think about your business take some time to step out of it once in a while and be strategic about growing it and improving it instead of always keeping your head down um, because you can really lose track of your vision and of your strategy if you don't take the time to focus on that once in a while and focus on your numbers again this is not rocket science kind of a duh, uh, point but you need to know what your numbers are. You need to know your costs. You need to know your expenses. You need to know how much you're making on a given project, even if it's just you. Um, and know what you need to do to make more on a project. Or maybe it means selling different types of projects um, so that you are more profitable and have better margins. And again, um, might sound like common sense. Well, of course, we only know our numbers, but um, so many people don't. And so, you know, take the time, do some number crunching, even if it means sitting with your accountant or maybe a friend who was a finance major, uh, because I'm certainly not a numbers guy. I, I do not know accounting, I do not know finance, but I've at least had to. Um, by default, I've had to learn the basics and the things that I need to keep track of and you have to at least become good enough um, to know the things that I need to know. So take the time and, and, and master your numbers and know them at all times and know how to make them better. And you know, this is a little bit outside of business, but focus on your health. Um, I certainly could do a better job of this, but I've probably lost about 20 pounds over the past four years. And um, that's helped. That's helped me a lot. Uh, being healthier, eating better, exercising more, Drinking less, uh, the, the whole combination of things that we could all do to be healthier. Um, believe me, it will help your business. It's, um, it, affects, it affects how we work, it affects our focus, our ability to be productive. It affects our mental fitness and, and being able to focus on all of the things and be better at the things that we need to for our business. Um, and I know that it's helped me a lot. Um, and you know, it kind of related to my last slide of my wife and I. I was um, I was a bachelor for most of my adult life. I was one of those guys who got married much later than most people do. And I'm not saying everybody should go and get married and everybody needs a traditional relationship. That's not at all what I'm suggesting. But once I finally decided to settle down and got married. Uh, became a non-bachelor, I'd say starting about eight years ago, it, it changed my business life too. Um, I was out too much, I had too much freedom in my life, just doing whatever, staying out as late as I felt like, and starting work whenever I felt like in the morning, and um, again, I did fine, business was okay, and, and I paid the bills, but once I fixed some of these things in my personal life, like the health, like the relationships, the things that I was not so focused on in my early years in business, things turned around a lot. Um, and things have only gotten a lot better since I took care of some of those things that are not related to my business. Um, so again, it might not be the same for everybody and it might not be about getting married, but relationships in general, with your family, with friends, going back to the people slide, it all helps a lot and will contribute to the health of your business. And that's all I got. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. This is a little bit of a silly question, but what did you actually say to that awful client to get her up, to, to say no? 
did it once before. That's what I did. So set, was that? What, what, you said it was tactful, but what did you actually say to that client? I'm not sure what the question was. <laughs> um, so the question was, you know, what did we say to the client we didn't want, and it was tactful. It, it, it was honest. I mean, we felt we said it tactfully, but we had to say that, you know, during the course of these few conversations we've had over, the, over these few weeks, and we cited some specific exam examples where, um, I mean, the, the general thing was, we don't feel this is a great personality fit, right? But, and here's why, and, and you know, in this particular conversation, you didn't seem too comfortable with this answer, you pushed a little bit more than we were comfortable with, and we, we cited some very specific examples, and generally, again, and as a result of that, no offense, we just don't feel a great fit with the personalities here. It's offensive, I'm sure, even though we say tactful, I, I'm not suggesting we didn't insult the person unintentionally, it might have happened, but ultimately we moved on. <laughs> yes? Done. Um, uh, yeah. Take one more. Thanks. So, um, thank you. and I'll be outside, by the way, if anybody has any questions that we didn't have time for. Thanks. So, um, people obviously have different ways of finding clients. Uh, most people's clients come most of word of mouth. Um, if you're just starting out, you have to do a lot of networking. If you narrow your focus, and maybe there aren't so many potential clients in the area that you've chosen. How would you recommend going about identifying and, and finding those clients? So that's a, that's a whole talk in itself. And, um, and one that, and, I, and I'd like to talk to you outside the room if you have a minute, because the, the, the two ladies here who I said are related to me, they're part of our marketing department. And we have such a comprehensive effort in terms of identifying clients who do fit our target client, building that database up in our CRM. We use HubSpot as a CRM system determining the multiple decision makers even within those companies, how we go about reaching out to them and, and developing content that they'll be interested in or messages that will be compelling to let them to make them want to talk to us. Um, it's a, like I said, I would love to hold a half day or a day seminar just on the answer to your question, but I think if we could chat outside, I can provide even more detailed insight into targeting and, 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 how, to, and how to find more of those clients, even if it's a very finite group of companies, okay? Um, I think we, we don't have time for more questions, right? So I'll be right outside the room if anybody has anything else. Thanks again.